Perfect. Thanks for having me. Um, as Lorena said, uh, these are my findings from my master's thesis. So uh, we can definitely chat after the presentation and discuss some things, because they might not be what you thought, because it certainly wasn't what I thought. Um, so just to provide a bit of an overview, I'll talk a little bit about the significance of the study, as well as some of the gender discourses found in previous literature throughout sport. I'll move into the purpose and methodology of this specific study, as well as I'll discuss the findings and conclusions, and then some um, limitations and future directions for research. So, so core ideologies throughout sport culture continue to maintain the idea of sport as a male domain, with football being the epitome of masculinity. Um, women competing in football strain um, the traditional construction of masculinity because it requires its players to display characteristics of physicality, aggression, strength, and all of those characteristics are typically associated with and valued in men and not necessarily in women. But over the last five years, there's been a significant increase in um, women's tackle football in North America. So with the emergence of new teams and increased participation rates and even features in the NFL awards and during the Super Bowl. Um, in the States, there are three leagues that make up for a total of 91 teams. And in Canada, there are two leagues that make up for a total of 12 teams. So women's tackle football is also often mistaken for the LFL or the Legends Football League. Um, but for the purpose of this study, I focused on football and refer to it thereafter as um, women's football, just to ensure people know the scope of the work. So in football, the rules, regulations, and equipment requirements are identical for men and women. So theoretically, the women's game could become as popular as the men's game. I wish to explore some of the reasons why it hasn't and what's preventing it from reaching that level of acceptance and popularity. So much of the research related to football has focused primarily on men. The research that does exist on women's participation focuses on masculine sporting ideals, body images of women in sport, and identity development to the players. Um, this study aimed to address the absence of research on female football players, perceptions and acceptance of women's football, as well as the gender discourses within the game. So what is discourse? It's a broad analytical category referring to a set of language that holds meaning and purpose. And Norman Fairclough equates the concept of discourse with language. As we know, language has the potential to shape our thoughts, inform our beliefs, our identities, and even our behavior. So for instance, the phrase, you throw like a girl, is often heard by many young children. Unfortunately, it equates a male's poor performance um, with his pitch or a throw with a female's natural and supposed inferior performance. So the language we use shapes our interpretations and our expectations moving forward. To understand what effect, if any, gender discourses have on the development of women's football, uh, Fairclough's conceptualization of critical discourse analysis was used to guide my analysis of both written and spoken communication. Um, prior discourses about football currently associate the game with the National Football League, Canadian Football League, NCAA college football. Additionally, the media coverage and school program offerings have inherently shaped society's knowledge of football to be associated with male and masculine attributes. So some of the more prominent gender discourses that do exist currently in sports and in specifically in hypermasculine female sports that I expected to find um, are the following five, and I'll just discuss them a bit so you have some ideas. First is the idea of the contradiction or the paradox of the female athlete. So a perfect example of this is the term female athlete. When people uh, refer to Serena Williams, they often say she's the world's greatest female athlete, but when we talk about Tom Brady or Roger Federer, we don't say the world's best athlete, or we don't say the world's best male athlete, we say the world's best athlete. So women are constantly balancing that idea of being female and being an athlete as opposed to just being athletes. The second is the idea of gen that there does exist gender appropriate sports. Um, so aesthetic sports like gymnastics and figure skating are deemed to be more appropriate for women uh, because they meet the narrow parameters by which a woman can display her athletic um, prowess and still maintain her elegance and her grace. The third is the idea of the female frailty myth which is based on um, the idea that reproduction is a woman's sole purpose. So this is, um, so women's sports are considered to be inferior because of the adoption of female-specific rules, like in women's hockey, which sees the elimination of body contact, or even in women's tennis, where they play three sets instead of the five that men play. Um, the fourth idea is sexualization and sexuality in gender, in, in gender inappropriate sports. So females, um, female athletes are constantly negotiating the physical and sexual meanings associated to their bodies, especially when competing in hypermasculine sports. So if a woman displays athletic superiority, her sexuality is immediately questioned. 
as if her physical attraction to others is related to her athletic abilities. The way that females contest this stigma is by hypersexualizing themselves, which is also known as the apologetic defense. And the fifth is the, the maintenance of male hegemony. So just the idea that by viewing female athletes as women who play sports, rather than accepting them as athletes, there exists um, a lack of approval for female athletes within society, which then reinforces discourses of conditional equality. So the purpose of this study was uh, to examine the discourses associated with women's football and their perceived effects on the development of the women's game in Canada. And when I talk about development, I'm talking about skill level of the players, increased number of players, increased number of teams, just that increase, overall increase in popularity in the game. So it's certainly more of an insider perspective. Um, and the two questions I used to guide the research were what gender discourses are present in organized women's football and what effects, if any, do these discourses have on the development of women's football? So my research offered a unique opportunity to consider women's disadvantages in sports and the discourses that serve to reinforce these notions. Um, I utilized a qualitative research method because it allowed for a broad approach to understanding a social phenomena and exploring that phenomena, which is the language that we use. Um, and since I was focusing on a particular group within society, I did use a case study design. I also used two data collection methods, an in-depth semi-structured interview as well as a self-ethnography, and I'll get into those a bit later. Um, I had nine participants for the study, uh, four athletes, which referred to players, and five non-athletes, which referred to coaches, administrators, um, and managers. It should be noted that two of the non-athletes were previously athletes. That's why there's now more non-athletes. Um, in terms of the recruitment process, I, participants that were identified by myself through purpose of sampling were sent a recruitment email and encouraged to forward that to others who they thought might be interested and eligible to um, participate in the study. So snowball sampling was also used. Um, the criteria was that the participants had to have either played, coached, or managed a Canadian female-only tackle football team during the 2016-17 season or be committed to doing so for the 2017-18 season just so that the information was current at the time. Um, and pseudonyms were assigned to all the participants to maintain con confidentiality. So the primary uh, method of data collection was an in-depth semi-structured interview, which was audio recorded, um, so it could be transcribed later on. The, um, the interviews were conducted over the phone uh, if the person was out of province and, or even out of the city, and then in person if they were from the city. And they lasted about 30 to 60 minutes and involved open-ended questions. Um, there was a specific questionnaire for athletes versus the non-athletes. And the interviews occurred between March 25th and September 24th of 2018. In terms of the self-ethnography portion, I utilize my position as a female football player um, to draw attention to the cultural context in which I was in. Um, so my pre-existing acceptance and comfortability with the team provided me with insider insight into the discourse ex discourses experienced. Um, so that was conducted during the 2018 Regenerate preseason, season, and postseason. So the data, in terms of the data analysis, I used um, kind of there were three main phases that were involved. The first was the preparation, which in, involved um, conducting the interviews and transcribing them into a Word document. And then this helped to bring the data into more manageable, manageable pieces um, for the purpose of bringing meaning and insight uh, into the discourses that were used. The second step was organization. So after an initial examination of all the data, I recognized that a more systematic um, I was going to need a more systematic way to capture all the information that was there. So all the transcripts were moved into an Excel document, separated row by row for each sentence. Um, and then that still, there was a ton of data, basically, way more than I had anticipated. Um, so I realized that I was going to need a coding scheme. So I devised a coding scheme, and each sentence was coded with one to multiple codes with extra notations made about the themes and different subjects that were talked about. And then in terms of the analysis, um, the coding scheme was color-coded so that I could note vi or like visually see repetitions and frequently mentioned ideas, and then from there dissect those themes and um, to see which were the most prominent. And then once I had that, I also was just able to count strictly the number like, of colors that there was, and it became really apparent which discourses were most prominent. In terms of the, um, the data analysis for the self-ethnography, I subscribe to what Anderson proposed as an analytic self-ethnography. So I documented my personal experience throughout the Regina Riot preseason, during season, and postseason, um, which was March 2018 to June, the end of June 2018. 
and just made reflections after games, practices, team events, occurrences in the media, because we happen to have a lot that year. Um, just different things and just reflected on how people reacted to that, what the discourses were surrounding those, those events and those happenings. So the findings were much different than I anticipated, and I was really pleasantly surprised um, with some of the themes that came through the data. The first is this overarching sense of uncertainty surrounding the women's game. Um, first off, in becoming a female football player. Um, many players don't even know that women's elite football teams exist, um, let alone they don't have experience when they come to the sport, which is really rare when you're joining a sport at an elite level. The second is the idea that knowing football is an option. There, do, there exist few opportunities for women to first try the sport at a recreational level. Furthermore, um, I think a lot of the participants, the common sentiment was, I didn't even know it was available to me. It was the one sport my brother could play that I thought I couldn't. So just even that barrier of not even realizing it's available to you. Um, and the third is the involvement from elite coaches. I mean, many of the male coaches in this study did not originally seek out coaching opportunities in the women's game. They might have been asked by a friend or a colleague. And many coaches were unaware that women's leagues and teams existed. Moreover, what that would look like given women's lack of previous experience in the sport. Um, some even expressed insecurities in regards to coaching a team of women despite having maybe you know, decades worth of coaching experience. One participant stated that when he arrived at the team SAS practice, his impression was, wow, you ladies were competitive, you were skilled, you were committed. And on one hand, this is really positive and supportive, but on the other hand, it shows that men are continually surprised at what women can do. And I think even using the term ladies to refer to the elite level athletes un undermines the legitimacy of them as competitive athletes. So the second theme um, is that women's football remains to be seen as an alternative version of the sport despite the lack of rule alterations, which was consistent with previous discourses within hypermasculine sports. Um, football has always been advertised as a male sport, which contributes to the perception that females' participation in football is unusual. Um, and then the di differentiation also implies that the sport varies from what is perceived as American football or men's football. Um, so then it, also, it often results in associating the game to other non-contact versions, um, whether that be flag or touch football, sometimes even powder puff football. Um, participants noted that the, the problem is not that the women's sport exists, but that it's structured as a discrete category of the men's sport, which then in turn downplays the level of the athletes competing, the physicality that the game actually entails, and acts as a barrier to legitimizing um, the women in the game. So one participant made this statement, and I thought it was really insightful and captured my experience. Um, people immediately think the players are not as fast, not as strong, not as whatever. Compared to a male, maybe not, but in their own league. Other players added to the sentiment saying, I'm not trying to be a male football player, I'm trying to be a female football player. And that's not to say that um, we should grow the game from a young age, both men and women, but I think right now, just given women's disadvantages in the sport, there does need to be this separation, and we can't just associate the two leagues and assimilate them and compare them all the time, because um, they're, they're two different, yeah, they come from two different histories, I guess. The third finding, um, oh, sorry, I'm just gonna find my page. So the third finding was that there is this belief um, that development is possible in women's football. And I think this stems from an overall cultural shift towards inclusivity on a global scale. Um, discourses reflected that women's participation was treated with less suspicion, criticism, and even negativity than expected, and instead more curiosity, which is really positive. I think shifting societal representations of femininity and femaleness, um, as well as culturally inscribed representations of female athletes, has contributed towards this, this acceptance. And I'm really interested to see how the US national women's soccer team stance and their lawsuits unfold in the coming years and how that will affect future generations of women in sport at the national level, provincial levels, um, every, even local levels. Um, the second thing is that this belief in development, it's gonna, the sports media is gonna play a critical role in this. In 2011, Kane and Maxwell referred to sports media as one of the most powerful institutions in US culture. And this is because sports media generally reproduces um, relations of power uh, as well as values and ideolo ideologies throughout its coverage. So despite the increase in popularity of women's football in Canada, um, participants' responses from the in interviews indicated that the general public doesn't have an accurate understanding of female football and what its players look like. Um, and this may be because of the lack of representation in the media or even misrepresentation. 
So I think the way a sport is marketed, marketed and advertised will impact who participates, in this, especially um, from young ages moving onwards. Finally, this kind of leads into the third point, which is um, as a newer sport, women's football will certainly need a lot of support from provincial sporting organizations as well as national sporting organizations. And this right now varies significantly um, between provinces. Saskatchewan's kind of unique in the sense that it has this great football culture, having the Rough Riders and then having Football Saskatchewan. Um, and a lot of perfor- support is provided for, um, you know, from RMF to the, to the Thunder. Um, but then in, di- in provinces like BC and Ontario, that support doesn't exist yet. So how do we build that? moving forward. So what does this mean? Um, so women's contact, or women's sports are at a critical state of change, and because of the shifting paradigms in society, um, I think football has a great chance of being part of that change moving forward. Adis- additionally, participant transcripts and analysis of personal experiences revealed that while there remains a strong dependence on the men's game, one could argue that emerging discourses of ambiguity as opposed to negativ- negativity are beginning to challenge conventional gender roles in relation to football. And then within the cautious optimism expressed, there does exist transformative pot- potential. And I think uh, participants expressed this in different ways. Some thought that grassroots programming might be the solution. Um, Some thought that marketing the sport for both genders could help, increasing awareness by incorporating the female game into coaching clinic videos so that coaches even know that the sport exists and this is just another another version of it. So there's definitely awareness and initiative, but now it's about implementation. Um, So because I did have a really small sample size of coaches and players, it is hard to understand all the barriers or opportunities in women's football. I didn't talk to fans or sponsors or families, and those are large contingencies within the game who are involved, and I think it'd be important to hear their um, perspective moving forward. Other limit- limitations, um, because of the la- lack of popularity or newness, there did exist a tendency to compare um, women to their male counterparts, and rather than view the league separately. And then finally, like I had mentioned, I thought logis- logistics were a huge limitation just because Saskatchewan has this unique tradition of excellence when it comes to football. So some of the players' um, perceptions might have been a lot more optimistic here than they might have been um, if they were from Quebec or out east. Because I did, ha- the participants were from kind of nationally spread out across the country. Uh, in terms of future directions, I think. Uh, conducting a critical discourse analysis from a national and international perspective would provide insight if this is, um, if it does have the potential to grow on a national level. Like this is a picture of Andrea Romero, who's a running back from Mexico, and she's referred to as the next Ezekiel Elliott or the female Ezekiel Elliott, which is great. And she's going to move over to the states to play. But is this a sustainable lifestyle, and is this going to be supported? And just yeah, knowing more about that, I think conducting a longitudinal study as well. Um, following a player over their career or even a team to understand what other barriers um, are infringing upon the development would provide great insight. Um, Replicating the study in areas where there exists little development, like in Ontario, BC, even in Quebec, because um, Montreal does have a team, but they've had to, they were a part of the American League. They had to disband from it just because of travel restrictions and the cost, but now they also don't receive support from their provincial sporting organizations. So how can, there is a team there, there's women that want to play, how do we develop that instead of hindering it? And then focusing on women's involvement in various facets facets of the game, such as um, at the board level, coaching level, is there a mentorship programming that we could do to increase involvement at all levels? So that's all I have. Thanks for listening.